He hadn't felt any pain. Okay, so this is Arturo, isn't it? Possibly, yeah. It immediately maybe. feels like, oh, Did he, he survive? Got... Oh, that made me realize he survived, maybe. That's exciting. Yeah, just him saying he hadn't felt any pain. I'm like, the only person contextually this could be to my in my head is Arturo waking up from the gunshot that he didn't feel that knocked him out so quick. He doesn't feel any pain right now, either. Not physically, at least. It's something deeper. It's about who he used to be, who he is now, and who he's about to become. Something profoundly terrible has happened, and it's changed everything. He knows that much, at least. What he really wishes to know right now is who the hell he even is. He tries to think back to what he last remembers. Oh, does he have... I mean, if... So if this is like a Brian and Echo situation, if he got hit in the head, maybe he's like concussed or has brain damage or something. Yeah. Or at least at the moment can't, like... Yeah. If he has like swelling, he just like can't process right now. Yeah. Standing in front of everyone in second grade, his trembling paws holding up his book report. He clears his throat, trying to figure out how to put his sentences together in advance. Yep. Called it. I'm so happy you lived. Speak I mean, up, he's Arturo. Horrifically, the whole horrifically class needs to hear but... you. Arturo. That's his name. Arturo Herrera. He opens his eyes. But how did he end up here? Where are his classmates? Second grade. Or was it third? No, he's positive he's at least in high school. He tries again to remember what happened last night. He was sitting in, in junior parking lot with his girlfriend. She was upset because another girl at school was being mean to her. She's a Jaguar, sitting in the passenger seat of his beat up sedan, one of her feet up on the dash, and he's leaning toward her to kiss her on the cheek. Yet another example of same species coupling <laughs> in uh -huh, a universe he, where people are inexplicably always marrying their same species. Well, it's because he's so straight. <laughs> straight people marry the same thing, like in Beastars. What's her name? <laughs> in Beastars, logistically, only one in 20 people can be straight by that rule, and yet everyone somehow finds a way. <laughs> What's her name? Sarah Mendoza. Or was it Montoya? But now he remembers that they didn't last long at all. Maybe only a semester. Probably because he sucks at comforting people. He does always say the wrong thing at the wrong time. <laughs> Meta commentary. <laughs> but he still had several girlfriends after her. Up until... M M M Maria? His voice is so alien, so strange. It startles him a bit. I'm not your Mary. <laughs> That's all I could think of. Oh. We thought of different horror media. <laughs> I was thinking of a character who suffered a head wound in uh, Walking Dead, struggling to say his wife's name like that. Yes. Yeah. What's even more strange is how hard it is to even say her name. He stutters. And he has to chew around the syllables like he's biting at the letters. As he does, he notices a sour taste in his mouth. And he can smell vomit. Looking at the forest floor in front of his face, he sees a dried mess of what he's sure is the source of the smell. Oh, he's lucky. He's lucky that he managed to, to land where he did so that he didn't drown in his own puke. Because yeah. this means he's definitely, it's definitely like a concussion or some sort of brain damage. Well, he was he was running, so I think he land. I think he fell face first. Yeah. Bits of something orange and mushy, and chunks of what he recognizes as jerky. Things are starting to come together, but it takes a long time, maybe even an hour, as he goes in and out of consciousness. Maria, Pueblo, Devon, psychology, graduation, behavioral tech. Road trip. Accident. Echo. Cameron. T. 
THC cartridge. Visions. Ghosts. Panic. Bear. Gunshot. Gunshot. He's been shot. It's only now he realizes his current position. Curled up on his side, arms folded up in front of his chest. He tries to move his arms, but like everything else he's trying to do, it's very difficult. His muscles feel unnervingly weak, and every time he moves, it comes with an uncomfortable, uncontrollable twitching and trembling. Arturo stares at his paws, watching the tremors, trying to quell the panic. Finally, he slowly manages to sit up. Immediately, dizziness overtakes him, and he has to pause for several seconds before he's sure he's not going to fall back down. Once he's sitting up, his stomach turns and he dry heaves, and that's when he feels the pain. It's not terrible, but the deep, cold throb at the back of his head feels remarkably wrong. With a shaking paw, he reaches back and finally feels the damage. The fur is crusted and matted, becoming a bit damp as he gets closer to the source. His fingers brush over a slight gap, like there's a small crater in his fur. As he presses down, he realizes the crater goes past the fur and past the skin. Then he feels something oddly hard and almost sharp. Arturo gasps, realizing that the stiff, jagged thing he's running a, f a finger over is his broken skull. He jerks his paw away, breathing hard. He was shot in the head. In the head. He remembers deciding to run, since the shotgun wasn't loaded, but then the bear had taken out another gun, a handgun, and then... How is he alive? How long will he stay alive? Is there a bullet in his brain right now? He knows he needs something, so he tries to ask for it. I, 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 I need, need, need shelf M melt. He struggles not to stutter, to say the right words that he knows he's trying to use. This is bad. Devin was hurt too, maybe even killed. And Cameron, he was already hurt. And it was a monster in, his, in this forest that can hurt him. The cat brings his knees up to his chest, putting his arms around them like, a chi like he's a child. He feels like a child, helpless and completely confused as he sits injured in this terrible forest. This must be some kind of awful dream, and he wants to wake up, even though everything feels familiar, unfamiliar, surreal, dreamlike. He knows this is real. Arturo feels his face crumple as he starts to cry, pushing his forehead against his knees. I, I need, 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 need some, 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 something. No, wrong words. I, I, I need, need someone. There's some relief as Arturo feels like he's improving at least a little bit. Maybe this is only temporary. He'd been told several times in his psych and neuroscience courses that the brain is plastic. The fact that he's recalling these memories, making sense of these memories, gives him hope. But there are still certain things, very simple things, that are missing. Ruined my life. Arturo jerks his head to look up, heaving again as another wave of dizziness and nausea sweeps through him. Cameron? Cam Cam Cameron? Hmm. He looks. He seems less primed to be Kudzu in this situation. This is distressing. Yeah. He well, looks. In I mean, thing. One thing to say uh, from a like silver lining perspective is, if this is all that he's experiencing right now from this, then like. It's actually not too bad. Like, I mean, it's bad. Don't get me wrong. This is awful. But it'd like, be, he's it'd already be fucking terrifying. Really, yeah. Like, this could have been way worse. The fact that his he's able to even adjust like this, and like, 
yeah, things are awful, but I think he could heal. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to bring up, it's kind of interesting, but um, how do I say this? Um, it, it's kind of interesting because earlier, obviously, they did the very obvious signposting of like, hey, man, if my way is to go out is to get shot, then I guess I'm going out getting shot. Oh, yeah, but I like, was thinking about that last night. Yeah, it's interesting that they signpost this and then lampshade it because he seemed comfortable isn't the right word but like thematically speaking he's like if I go out getting shot that's just the way I'm meant to go out and now he has something worse which is that he probably should have gone out getting shot and now he has to live like this which is like a, a, a truly deeper horror he clearly is not prepared for uh that's just cruel. That is a very yeah. cruel fate to be handed to him. It's also that the call out of like all those people are like, my retirement plan's a shotgun at 40, huh? <laughs> and then you actually age and actually have experience and context and that like those like shitty jokes just don't work anymore. Yeah. He looks in the direction of the sound. He sees a trailer partially hidden behind tree trunks and bushes, about 30 feet away. His right ear pops loudly several times, and he rubs at it, feeling fluid come out. Mm -hmm. I learned this from the Resident Evil novelization. <laughs> or if you take... <laughs> okay. It's, a uh, Jill... Jill Claire. Claire, it's Claire, because, because, uh... Because the little, the little girl's there. It's uh, Claire takes a bad hit in the novelization of Resident Evil 2. And specifically, there's this detail of, like, she's she prays and confirms that the fluid coming out of her ear is red. Because if it's, if it's blood. Because if it's, if it's clear, then it's, like, spinal fluid or something. And that's a significantly larger problem. Yeah. And that's just, and that's the only thing I remember from that book. But I used to read. I read every novelization of Resident Evil Zero through Code Veronica before playing a single Resident Evil game, all the way back in like high school, and I remember none of it. <laughs> back when I was mm. looking like Animorphs and stuff. <laughs> he knows it's blood. Better check though. <laughs> Heed Claire's warning. <laughs> <laughs> the cat slowly begins to stand up and immediately gets a terrible shock as he realizes the weakness he'd felt in his arms is also in his legs. He struggles and stumbles his way to the tree, trying not to panic again before finally leaning up against it. Nico, I can't breathe. Oh, he actually is hearing him. He's literally hearing him because he did yell that it ruined his life. Yeah. So so Cameron's successfully waking up both Arturo and Devin at the same time. But they've both got problems to deal with at the same time. Arturo realizes he's not the only one in this nightmare. Did the monster come back for Cam? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Arturo starts moving toward the trailer before it dawns on him, on his shattered, bewildered mind that he's looking at the bear's trailer. The one that shot him. He must have Cameron in there. Devin, help me, Devin, Devin! Arturo flinches back at the sound, and his fur bristles out along his spine, eyes wide as Cameron's screaming echoes throughout the forest. Look at, uh, look at the, the wound on his head. We were right, it did graze him. Yeah, you can see, like, a, a trench. Yeah, it like it broke the top of his skull, but didn't actually hit his brain. So like, yeah, it, it, so it, we have more I mean, information honestly, than he does. Yeah, and he's really lucky too, because that means that you know theoretically this could actually heal. I mean, he might have brain damage from being concussed, but damn, he got lucky. But that also means like Brian is a fucking crack shot because yeah, he, was he running actually away. hit a head. That's nuts. That it, that requires a lot of hand eye, especially for a gigantic drug addict 
meth addicted bear. Holy yeah. smokes. It's a shot that you're literally told not to take. Yeah. Like it's a video game mechanic, not a real life place you aim because it's such a bad idea because you're so unlikely to hit. That's actually something that's worth talking about is like uh, people people don't realize this. Like we're, we're trained from video games to think guns work a certain way, but like you get shot in the chest, you're you're just you're fucked. Like you're just dead. Like there's it's very very hard to survive a gunshot wound basically anywhere on your body. But like getting shot in the body is like pretty much a death sentence. So aiming for a head is just like nonsense. There's no real point to do it. So it's just like it's crazy. It's like it's like when you try to understand the reality of this situation of like Brian landed a headshot on a Jaguarundi that was running away from him is truly it like makes Brian even more terrifying. He didn't even need guns. <laughs> like he really did no. not need guns. It's almost like they on some level it's they even like it's almost like they slightly contrived having a gun just so someone could survive Brian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The cat looks around desperately, hoping that Devin does come to help. Even though that evil bear is bigger, Devin's a pretty big bear too, and he would stand a much better chance than he himself would. Thuds followed by yelps and howls come next. And finally, it's too much for Arturo. D -d 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 Dev, y y y y Cam Cameron. He can't go in there like this. He knows that, but he can get help. Maybe. Oh, this, his crying is advanced too. Yeah. The expression keeps getting worse. The I, I love the sequence CGI, the CGs that should that yeah. morph. Like it's such a great change. It Depending really on. gives the characters, like, a lot more characterization, too, because you can do so much more with it that's, like, actively, you get your attention drawn actively to it. Oh, yeah. I was curious about it. The, uh, Pain fought, like, when it, when I, 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 I told Pain about that, and he, he said, at least his, the quote, what he said at the time, at least, is, I push to have as many CGs as possible because with the full illustration, you can really set a mood, taking advantage of lighting and camera angle, interacting poses, etc., which is way less effective if you have just have a couple sprites in front of a background. It's just, I was just, I just was reading the DM. And I that's can't interesting. Wait. If, as if, like, yeah. if he specifically was, like, like gung ho about getting as many uh, CGs in as possible, because there are so. I've never yeah. played a visual novel with this many CGs. It's really impressive. I mean, and it speaks to, I think, a level up in like art direction. Like literally what he was just describing is like scene direction and art direction and yeah. framing. And like that's stuff that like a normal visual novel, I think a trap that a lot of especially amateur visual novels fall into is that like visual novels are a very structured thing to create. This is not me saying that visual novels are like easy to make, right? But like a lot of people who don't have a lot of skills um, cinematographically or from a game design perspective or even from like in terms of like comics right like the planning of a comic is a lot more freeform and treacherous for a newcomer than the idea of a visual novel which is like all right i need to have 10 backgrounds i need to have eight sprites eight or eight character sprites and then that's like variated over the course of like 12 expressions each. So like that gives you a list of like, all right, I need 150 assets, right? Or like something like that. But that again, takes away your, your flexibility. So a lot of people will are attracted to visual novels because they're like, all right, I can just write what I want to write and then work through getting the very static list of things I need in order to like flesh it out and then just like, you know, shit it out on the steam front page or whatever you're going to do with it right uh and i don't say that in a derisive way that's just like I, that's one of the reasons why i was attracted to to making visual novels in high school was like it very much was like a checklist of things that you needed to do rather than needing to figure out like a thousand different edge cases on like you know if you're trying to design a 3d game you're like i need a door except for when i needed to open this direction in which case i need a completely different model and you know like all those different things so it's really cool to see uh, visual novel creators adapt 
and try to expand what the medium can do either through you know clever tricks like what echo does with the embrace in order to animate it or even in this game with like seemingly like all of the plugins and like new RenPy features that allow you to do things like animations or animated backgrounds and even with this just like relying more heavily on cgs to set the tone than individual assets that can be manipulated um in terms of like sprites and backgrounds the art style just really hits too like i this this, this sounds off topic at first but like i always i think about the fact that like the the number one show that has made me cry the most is futurama <laughs> okay, it's, that yeah. it's that juxtaposition of like the funny wacky friendly people then have a sad moment and it it's like devastating because of that juxtaposition yeah. and the the moral the emotional contrast and like paint fox has like these like bork thunder summer vacation beach vibes in his art like they're 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 happy funny cartoon animals being gay and yeah then you get to arches and it's the same art style and horrible things are happening and it's grim and this visual style and head wounds and like the like it's that seeing that art style and those characters drawn that way who were themselves like just hanging out and had getting high in the back of a jeep earlier <laughs> in the way that was very like the art style i'm used to seeing him draw and then this is in the same style is like very <laughs> uncomfortable yeah. yeah extremely i have no idea i don't i have no idea who's doing the background in that i i know who the options it's either cardamon or paint fox i just don't know because if, if he was like if, if he was pushing to do a bunch of CGs, then there's ones. Uh, it's it's like it's one thing to do it if you're just gonna do them all yourself, but if you're getting other people involved, that's like a, a larger effort, obviously. And like yeah. these are the more detailed CGs that feel. These are the more detailed backgrounds that feel in line with the rest of the game. So I feel like it might be Cardamon, which makes this like a, a like a multiple artist like collaboration thing. But I'm I'm genuinely not sure. I don't remember paint fox's backgrounds very specifically right now I'm, I'm, I'm not as good at spotting those as character designs this yeah is... yeah i don't know it's it's really interesting i i do really like the way this game looks i think it i think it looks great i, I don't I, I don't i just want to already get out of this this is so fucking distressing <laughs> i know i, mean, I would not hold it against him if he just fucking bailed <laughs> I mean, I don't. There's so little he can do besides look for Devin. Basically, if he gets spotted by yeah. Brian in any way, he just dies. Yeah. Like if he well, fucking. One of the other things. He's like, he's like one moment of like falling wrong from dying, basically. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to mention here too with this is that like we talked earlier about how Artie is like reliable, like he's like a dependable dude. I think that like this characterization, I think it's really apt for him because like he's trying to figure out what to do if if he were to try to save Devin or uh, Cameron, which I think is what's going to happen. You know, it just goes to show that the setup of his character being this like goofy golden retriever who's like down to hang out with friends he hasn't talked to for five years was actually really, really deft signposting for like the man he is at his core and his like willingness to want to help and just be a good person. Artie is advanced Raven. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how bad it is, these problems he's having could get a lot worse over the course of just a few hours. But he has no choice. While he knows he has a car, he also knows that he can't use it, even though he can't remember why. He remembers that there's a highway, the one that they should have gone to the second he got here. He needs to get them all help. But with one more terrified look at that trailer, he starts to make his way out of the forest. He's gonna go for the highway with a head wound. Okay. We'll see how that goes. At first, Arturo is filled with a sense of hopelessness as he finds out just how hard it is to walk with his right side being almost limp. It feels like half his muscles just wasted away. I feel like he's going to find Duke. Mm. But after some trial and error, he finds that if he widens his stance a bit, and he swings his arms in a way that looks a bit lopsided, he's able to keep his balance. His pace is reasonable as well, so swallowing down his panic again, he makes his way back onto the dirt road.
He's so brave. Oh my this, god. This is an absurd choice. Oh jeez. He's, he, he's so much hotter now. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna fucking brain damage force walk himself through 100 degree desert heat down like a five mile road to a, a freeway no one might even be on. This is this is this is an actual nightmare. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, not good. Like he's he's handling it very well for someone who essentially had the experience of like if you woke up dissected, like yeah, <laughs> the level exactly. of body horror happening here, and he's like genuine. He's like aware of the idea that he might literally be dead in a few hours, and he's just like going to do something with it. Even though the disbelief, yeah. even through the disbelief of his situation, even though he's terrified for Cameron and Devon. He feels something deep down that's even worse. He tries to ignore it, but it gnaws at the back of his brain. He's dying. And he can feel it. Has a lot of mirrors to to Sam and Echo. Sam. When we get the flashback to how Sam went Oh, out. Samuel, right. Yeah. Yeah, somebody walking on a road and, ha and having their final their final thoughts. Yeah, like maybe really out of it, road. knowing knowing that it's near the end, and then you know bad things happening to them. Oh man, what if Artie goes out the same way Sam did? I was like, going to say, I was literally about to say, like, what if he gets hit by a car on the same road? Uh. Devin struggles with his handcuffs, trying to get the chain into the position he wants. He pulls his paws up so that the chain is taut, uh, until the chain is taut, then moves slowly in a circle around the bolt until the chain twists on itself. This was the easy part, and based on the tension he felt being put on the chain links, he had been feeling pretty confident. Then he'd spent what feels like the last hour trying to actually put enough force and weight into the motion so that the chain would break. While the twisted chain is taking most of the pressure off of his wrists, it still hurts. Devin can see through his fur. He's already starting to bleed from his wrists. The fur is coming off in small tufts with each failed twist and jerk. Come on! Damn it! Please! After another failed heave, Devin slumps with his paws pressed to the floor of the van, gasping and sweating. A wave of dizziness comes over him, and he ends up pressing his face to the metal floor. Please. Please help me. Devin half-heartedly prays, just in case there is something above all this. Footsteps. Devin scrambles to twist back around to step over the anchoring boat, bolt so that his paws are behind him again, sitting up to face the back door of the van. It opens and Devin finds himself staring at the bear that did this to him. Even though he doesn't want Cameron anywhere near this man, seeing that the coyote isn't there with Brian sends panic through the younger bear. What do you want? Where's Cameron? Please. Shut it. Devin watches with dread as he sees the huge bear holding that water bottle. Please, just... Tell me what you want. I'll give it to you. Just let me see him. His teeth snap together, and the next thing the bear knows is that his head is resting against the metal cage partition that separates the back of the van from the seats. Dazed, his chin is on his chest, his arms under his back, forcing him to arch his chest and stomach toward the van's roof. Then Brian is, in on, is on him pressing the bottle to his lips. Dazed from the punch, Devin can only mumble in protest. No! No! Devin sees the look in the other bear's eyes, and he knows that eventually he's going to have to drink from the bottle again. Feeling completely defeated, Devin continues to plead with the man. Wait! Just wait! Please! Just tell me what you want! Is he okay? Boy, you're really starting to piss me off. If you don't want, if you don't do what the fuck I tell you, Brian grabs Devin's chest, fur, and both paws and hauls him up so he's sitting in a more upright position. 
I'm gonna take it out in your little cocksock yoke. You understand me? Now shut up. But Devin can't shut up. He's half convinced that Cameron's already dead. Please. Just let me see him so I know he's okay. Alright, I was gonna say you already earned, earned him one good hit. Now it's two. Wanna add a third? Devin just stares. Of course, he knows that Brian doesn't need an excuse. That if he really wants to hurt Cameron, he can. But there's nothing Devin can do. He can only do what the older bear tells him to do. So he opens his muzzle. Slowly, Brian pours the slightly bitter water into his mouth, and Devin drinks. Even though his body wants to keep drinking, Devin starts to pull back after only a few swallows, as if he's had enough, and doesn't even suspect the water is drugged. But Brian pushes the bottle hard enough that Devin's lips are painfully mashed between the plastic and his own teeth, and he's forced to keep drinking. And even when he lets a tiny bit dribble from the corner of his mouth, Brian growls more threats at him. Eventually the water is gone, and Devin hangs his head in defeat as Brian pulls back, backing out of the van. Devin squeezes his eyes shut, wishing this fucking bear would just tell him what's happening, what he's doing to Cameron, why he's keeping him alive. But the younger bear is too afraid to talk, too afraid of what Brian might do, and without another word, the, br the van door is slammed shut. Hmm... Hurl, bro. Puke. That's what I was thinking, yeah, is try to throw up the moment he's gone. But things are looking very bad for Cameron, because no one is coming. Cameron stays under the table, the Xanax having kicked in finally, uh, fully by this point, leaving the coyote in a bit of a quiet, stoic haze. His sobbing is trailed off. Not much emotion left in him, just feeling numb. His trip is getting more and more intense, and he knows that the peak is nearing. Maybe another half hour. Still, he begins to notice things that he sure aren't part of his trip. A presence, not too far away. One that he knows very well. Dev. With no idea what he's doing, he instinctively reaches out towards the warm energy. But he's interrupted by another presence he doesn't recognize. One that's much closer. Cameron gets on his paws and knees, looking out from under the table. This vision is definitely, some, definitely different than anything he's experienced before. Unlike the dreamlike, reality-altering... Psilocybin. <laughs> so used to this word. Psilocybin. There we go. Yeah. The vision he's entered has a clarity to it, like he's not even tripping at all. The figure of something, someone, appears before him, and Cameron knows everything immediately. All of the tree branches are arches. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I mean, even the table looks arched now. The doorway, the yeah, window. Yeah, everything is slightly warped. Look at, I mean, if you look at the windowsill itself, like, it's it's all slightly yeah, arched. Yeah, the entire thing. <clears throat> Benjamin Kowalski, a rabbit, born 1977, ran away from his Pueblo home when he was 16. For several years, he moved from city to city, sometimes in neighboring states, before settling in Peyton. He stocked shelves at a grocery store, and the extra money he saved up would fund his weed supply. Brian was his dealer. In September 1998, he agreed to let Brian take him to his trailer home in Echo. He was promised two ounces of weed in exchange for one night of lovemaking, as the bear love put it. Lovemaking? <laughs> lovemaking. Oh uh. Benjamin wasn't gay, and even if he was, he was pretty sure Brian wouldn't be his type. Two ounces was a lot, though and way too good to pass up. Bro, no one would would absolutely okay, I I've, I've heard of gay for pay before, but being gay for pay for 2 ounces of weed, I there I don't think there is a single person in the entire history of civilization that was like, yeah, I'll, I'll get I'll get it done to me for for 2 ounces of weed. Weed, I mean, 
I just, I don't know. There are one, easier ways to get weed, especially probably an Echo. And two, it's it's not that. That is a extraordinarily cheap way to go gay for pay. Like, you think someone would have a little bit higher, <laughs> a little bit higher of a price tag to, uh, you know, violate their own sexuality like that. Yeah, I have no idea how much two ounces is. I mean, it's it's a a lot in the sense that you could you could make that last a while, or I guess sell it. But uh, I don't know. That's a <laughs> just in the grand scheme of things. He just really hated his shelf stocking job. <laughs> yeah, clearly. This is I what, was gonna this, say. This is what I mean, customer might... service does to a person. Uh, yeah, man, I guess. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Let me let me Google something really quick. After four days of torture, Brian accidentally strangled him for too long, and Benjamin didn't regain consciousness. Okay, so an ounce of weed in California right now is about 200 bucks. Mm. Granted, this might have been a long time ago. I don't remember exactly... I mean, it's probably more, it probably would have been more expensive if it was hard to get back then, right? Yeah, exactly. But like, I mean, but in I, isolated... I do, I do feel like people would have sex for $400 regardless. 400 bucks? Yeah, maybe, maybe 400 bucks. But like, I guess in this case, like maybe, maybe that's like, let's be, let's be charitable and say that's like, that's like $1,500 worth of, of weed for Echo. I just... I think people would. I just don't... I think people definitely would. I just don't would. know... I just feel like I don't know any stoner who's like who's only in it for weed that would be like, yeah, you know, I get I guess I guess I'll let this meth bear rail me even though I'm straight for two ounces. Like, it's just it's funny if if I'm not talking shit on on Howley. I, I love his work. It's no, tough, you're talking shit on it's Benjamin just, or whatever. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. It's just it's profound. It's profound to me that the usage of like Xanax and ketamine and then psychedelics is so accurate. But then he's like, yeah, this rabbit, this rabbit just totally he he was slobbering over this gross meth bear just for two ounces of weed. It's like I've never met anyone. I've never met a stoner that desperate for weed. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like there's people that would do more for less. Oh, probably. But I mean, like, this guy's like, I'm not gay. And it's like, yeah, but you seem to you seem to be willing to to do to compromise those morals or, or those aspects of your identity pretty quickly for a what is relatively <laughs> a low cost, you know, opportunity. Yeah, but he doesn't have to enjoy it or anything or True. like that's just like it's like this this element of like you could just be like, I'll get it over with. And then at that point, it's just like. In the in the real in in the not reality where nothing goes wrong, then it's like yeah, it's like I got this for free. Yeah. I had to do this thing for a bit that was like not even like work, and then you just get over you just move past it and you're like, well that sucked, and then you move on with your life and now you have two ounces of weed that are like hundreds of dollars worth. It's like yeah, I guess that's pe fair. people get railed for PS5. Yeah. But also a PS5 is something that lasts you nine years, and two ounces <laughs> of weed is like. <laughs> not really not really gonna last you that long <laughs> of course brian planned on killing him anyway so he did the bear was only disappointed that he didn't give a few more days did get a few more days with him timothy esposito was a skunk born in 1985 in the midwest his hometown was a large industrial city one that had been in decay for his entire life. So he transplanted to Mesa. And in May 2005, that was where he attended a BDSM-themed event in an unused, an unused warehouse. He liked breath play, and so did Brian, so they fooled around a bit. He didn't much like Brian, but the bear liked him a lot. Brian liked him so much, in fact, that he followed the skunk as he walked home after the event, and kidnapped him on an empty street. Timothy was strong, and almost escaped multiple times, 
once managing to leave the trailer before being caught just a few dozen feet from the dirt road. Brian continued their breath play, even now, except now it wasn't play at all, and after two weeks, Brian again suffocated his victim for too long. This time, Brian thought he was fairly successful in keeping his victim alive that long. Daniel Gall Galagos was a ferret Gallegos. born in 1996. Gallegos. I think... Was, it a, was, was a ferret the body that Chase found? Ma maybe? There's a... Because Chase gets like a vision from a grave. Yeah. I'm trying to right. remember what it was. One of the things I wanted to mention, the only reason why I corrected that is just because the last two names were Hispanic names. So Brian is, in a way... I mean, it's obvious, like, these are the people that are in the area, but he seems to be going after minorities and Hispanic people more often. It reinforces the idea that I already highlighted, which is the idea that Brian, like a lot of real-life serial killers, preys on the less protected and marginalized groups because that's how they're able to get away for so long. Because the idea that there's, like, a super cool detective cop like in fiction that totally hunts down the bad guy and puts, puts all the genius clues together and wow they put these clues on this map it makes a star and in the middle of the stars Brian's trailer it's like not how anything ever works and most murders are unsolved and actual uh, serial killers that preyed on gay people like had their cops return their victims to them because of how unhelpful the cops were like they straight up just were not on their trail at all it's not that it's not that serial killers are dexter and hannibal like super villains yeah. that are so, so smart that they evade things so carefully it's that they in specifically reality target law... people that like aren't being looked for and yeah, yeah it's, like it's, people it's that the are reality left that, behind by the that, system like, law enforcement is just garbage. It's myth making, and and it almost never yeah. actually does anything resembling what people think of it as from fiction. And that's why it's called copaganda because it based it just lies about what cops do and what they are and what they serve and what the idea that they're magically bringing order and peace to the world because oftentimes horrible things are happening all the time, and they're indifferent to it and and, and completely ignorant to it, and it and it won't matter, and they will not stop it. Yeah. No, completely. Daniel Gallegos was a ferret born in 1996. He was from the Sonoran capital, but was staying with family in Mill City to work a summer job. He was saving up money for his university tuition. In August 2014, days before he was meant to head back to Sonora, he met Brian outside a club before being kidnapped and driven to Echo. Brian was able to keep him for an entire month, and even though a few of Brian's customers had seen him tired, tied to the torture rack, no one said a thing. This is this. Uh, there it is. Like that's, that's how fucking blatant Brian is. There are literally witnesses, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, and they just turn a cheek. Yeah, they don't. They they're just like, oh, yeah, it is what it is. Eventually, Brian seemed to decide he'd gotten all he could out of the ferret, and he bludgeoned Daniel to death with an old tire iron, just because he wanted to try something different. The bear couldn't believe how long it took, how hard he had to hit the kid before he finally, finally stopped moving. Cameron! Cameron is jolted back to reality as he yanked, as he's yanked up by his shirt so he's not even touching the floor. Second typo. It's less than normal. <laughs> uh, Brian's paws hold the front of his shirt while shaking him violently. What? What is it? Cameron kicks around and tries to get his feet on solid ground again. Despite being overwhelmed by the numbing calm of Xanax, it's not enough to stop the primal fear Cameron has of this bear. Especially not after seeing the horrors he committed on those men. What he'd just seen was condensed, distilled into an easy-to-follow series of events, but all the while he'd absorbed all the tiny details, too. He knows Brian promised these men many things, that, they'd only keep, that he'd only keep them for one, two, three more days before letting them go. 
that if they'd just be a little more quiet, he'd let them go. But Cameron knows none of those promises were kept. The visions had been so real that to Cameron, it felt like he'd been there for everything they went through. Luckily, he hadn't felt anything. But if it was as he was in the room with them, but it, but it was as if he was in the room with them, this room. Brian seems to gain some control over himself and lets go of the coyote. Cameron isn't able to stand as his weak, shaking legs. Oh, Cameron isn't able to stand with his weak, shaking legs and sits down heavily on the ground, looking up at the looming bear. You just have moments where you just you you realize, oh yeah, something's wrong with the sentence, and you have to like search back for where you made the mistake. <laughs> like this is not how the sen sentences work. Kept calling your name, and you didn't answer. I told you to let me know if the visions were starting. I, I couldn't. Brian waits, looking more impatient the more Cameron stammers, which only makes him stammer more. I swear to fucking God, why do all of you become whimpering little dipshits the second I lose my cool for like a second? Yeah, he's a psychopath. All right. <laughs> He reaches yeah. <laughs> down, and Cameron cringes as he's yanked up to his feet again. It's clear that Brian wants him to keep standing this time, so he does, steadying himself against the table behind him. Quit that crying! He does his best to stop, but the sobs keep coming. Brian. The visions. The people he just felt. It's not an easy thing to just shrug off. I said to quit, not be quieter. Cameron's mouth dries up even more, his tongue now sandpaper against the roof of his mouth as, as fear helps shock him into a statue-like state. Cameron knows he owes a lot to the sedative right now. Without it, he wouldn't be able to stop, and Brian might kill him. That's better. Be f but faster next time, got it? Okay. Cameron opens his mouth to answer, but finds himself yanked forward suddenly, only to come to a horrible, jarring stop as the bear slams his knee into the coyote's torso. Cameron watches the luminous arches writhe about, convulsing, almost like they're mirroring the coyote's inner turmoil. The knee is so big compared to himself that it seems to cover most of his chest and stomach. You can thank your boyfriend for that one, and he still learns your one more. Brian finally pulls back, and Cameron crumples to the ground, unable to process what Brian is saying. Not that he'd be able to understand it anyway. The coyote lets out guttural groans over and over again. Hmm? What's that you're saying? Brian taunts him from above, and Cameron responds with a whooping gasp pressing his face into the floor in agony. I asked you a fucking question. Cameron is lifted into the air again, feeling his feet kick around for purchase on the ground as he once again dangles from his shirt, the fabric stretching to the point that Cameron can hear the threads popping in the collar. Cameron cracks his eye open and sees Brian drawing back a huge paw and Cameron manages to choke out a few words with the tiny amount of air he's gathered into his collapsed lungs. Nothing, nothing. Cameron wheezes loudly between the words, knowing that this is exactly what Brian likes, but how can he stop himself? He's not even sure if stopping himself will help. Maybe that will only trigger Brian into hurting him more. But to Cameron's relief, the bear pauses then slowly drops his fist. Cameron sees the wild look in Brian's eyes gradually leave as he stares at the gasping coyote in his grasp. Good. Guess I'll save the other for later then. The bear lets go, and Cameron slumps back to his knees, curling up again in the fetal position. Now what was it you saw? Hmm. Nope, not good. <laughs>